Yeah. Okay. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm delighted to have Michael Strong here. Uh, he's the author of Habit of Thought. Uh, and uh, one more book. Yes, that's the, that's the book that I'm most, most interested in talking about. And the second book is Be the Solution. And we will be hearing about that too. So Michael, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here, Srikant. Excellent. So Michael, let's start by uh, telling, telling people about a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from? Uh, how, how did you grow up? Sure, sure. So um, I, I grew up uh, in Denver, Colorado, and on a farm in northern Minnesota. Um, my parents were uneducated. My mother is a high school dropout. My father was an elevator repairman, and he had grown up on a farm. So when I was 10, we moved from Denver, where he was repairing elevators, to Minnesota, where um, you know, we bought a 160-acre farm. And so I grew up milking cows and um, raising feeder pigs and you know, geese and horses and whatnot. Um, and I often say the best part of my own education, actually, is I grew up in northern Minnesota with bad TV reception, um, meaning that I ended up reading a lot. By um, the time I was in sixth grade, I was reading a 200-page book every night. Um, the other advantage uh, of my education, I would say, is I had long bus rides. So I was an hour and a half away from the town in which I went to school, so I had three hours of bus rides uh, all the time. And my best friend and I used to play chess. And we got to the point where we would, um, we, uh, we didn't have a magnetic chessboard when I got started. And so when we'd go over bumps, all of the chess pieces would fall apart, fall off the board. And so we'd have to remember where they were. And so we, we ended up playing chess in our heads. So I think the most important part of my education was not school, but reading a ton of books and um, playing chess in my head for years. Wow, wow, that's, that's amazing, that's amazing. So what did you do after, uh, what, what did you do uh, after school? You know, after finishing? sure. So, so this gets into the core of the Socratic uh, education that I've devoted my life to. Really, um, when I was a high school junior, I had a teacher where instead of regular school, we would talk about books and ideas. So we, we would read Plato, Nietzsche, Buber, and we'd just talk about them. I loved it. There is a college in the U.S. known as St. John's College with campuses in Annapolis, Maryland, and Santa Fe, New Mexico where for four years, all you do is talk about the books. It's known as a great books education. We start Western civilization going you know, uh, with the pre-Socratics and then Homer, and then all the way through mid 20th century with Einstein and Bohr and science, uh, ragtime and jazz, jazz and music. Um, we get into James Joyce and literature, that kind of thing. Um, but in high school, I simply loved, it was sort of like in many films, you, know, you go from black and white to color. And for me, going from being lectured at to talking about ideas was that kind of, wow, this is so much better. I was gonna drop out of my senior year of high school and go directly to St. John's, but instead I had good test scores. And so my college counselor suggested that I go to Harvard instead. So I applied to the Ivy Leagues, got into Harvard. And um, I went to Harvard thinking, okay, we can discuss ideas, but mostly I, there were a few small discussion classes, but mostly it was famous people talking at me. And so I was bored with famous people talking at me. I transferred to St. John's where for four years, read, think, and talk about ideas. And uh, that led me in graduate school to leading. While I was in graduate school, I was invited to lead Socratic discussions in Chicago public school classrooms. There was something called Mortimer, Mortimer Adler. Mortimer Adler was a famous 20th century US figure. Um, he had written his most famous piece is How to Read a Book. And it's a great, uh, you know, basically it's have a conversation with the book, engage with the ideas in the book, which for, for everybody here, duh, you're always arguing with books. But, you know, many people think you just read a book and put it off to the side. He's, he's a great, you know, annotation has become a big thing in uh, classes. But of course, he shows that real people who care about books are arguing in the margins of the pages all the time. Um, so I came out of that Mortimer Adler, Paideia, Socratic tradition. Uh, and I could slow down and go into detail on each element of that. And then uh, by accident, while I was in... Let's, let's pause. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm running fast. Go ahead. Uh, slow down. No, slow me down. I want people to appreciate uh, each of the points because you are you have made so many points, okay? And these are so fundamental and actually quite radical if you think about it, right? Because most people, the way they look at education, it's passive. You know, they sit in school and education comes at them, okay? Uh, and that is 
that is actually not what these ideas are. What you're trying to do in education is to get the person to actually think, not just get give them results of somebody else's ideas, because those cannot be used if they are just thrown at you. Um, so that is one, you know, instead of being lectured at, actually reading, thinking, and talking. Uh, so that one, that is one theme that I see. Uh, go ahead. So uh, let me bounce off that. So you're right. And part of this is I'm rushing ahead because I, I'm, I am very radical with respect to education. And a lot of it has to do with my background. But going into the details of St. John's a little bit, while it's known as a great books college, one of the features that's most radical there, not only are all classes for four years, nothing but discussion, that is there are no lectures at all, but also they um, require that every tutor, they call them tutor rather than professor, teach every subject. So if you come into St. John's with a PhD in physics, you're gonna to have to lead discussions on Greek and French and music and literature and religion and philosophy. And likewise, if you come in with a PhD in literature, you're gonna to have to lead discussions on math and science, um, which sounds crazy. I'm surprised they haven't had most, our, our whole education system is expertise and I'm the expert and I have a PhD and you know, I've written so many books, yada, yada, yada. Um, whereas this is, I, I was in classes at St. John's where as a student, um, I knew more than the tutor did. And you could say, what a terrible waste of time. And I was like, no, we're a learning club. So basically my model of learning is let's figure it out. Einstein's 1905 paper on relativity theory. Let's see if we can figure it out. And by means of thinking, talking, arguing, disagreeing, you know, what is this piece? Almost puzzle solving at some point. You can figure out amazing things. So I saw it as an incredible education in how to be an autodidact. And in part, it was an education in how to be an autodidact because we were not dependent on authorities. Um, again, even tutors, not authority. I'll give you one more piece and let you interject. One of my favorite tutors at St. John's said the ideal St. John's language exam was one where you didn't know what language you were going to uh, translate on Friday. So we've got a test on Friday. Maybe it's in Polish, Swahili, Mandarin, who knows, but you have a grammar and you have um, you know, lexicon and let's just, you know, you get a little paragraph and you figure it out. I sort of generalize that to my ideal final exam for one of my schools is you have a paper to read on Friday uh, is physics or associate theory theory, you don't know, but you're supposed to be able to read, think, and understand whatever. Um, obviously, you need a certain fluency in mathematical math. But still, the ideal is to figure it out that very much and, and ultimate autodidacticism where you're developing the, the ability to think and understand any kind of academic material or any kind of material anywhere. That's very much my uh, goal as an educator. Wonderful. Now I cannot resist uh, to spend time, resist spending time on Mortimer Adler because it's so rare that I get an opportunity to do that. So give me a, uh, giving you a little bit of background from my side. Um, I discovered the great books um, and Mortimer Adler about 10 years ago. And I spent three years uh, along with a friend going through the Syntopicon because Syntopicon, he kind of beautifully, uh, for people who don't know, uh, this project, a uh, great books project, is out of University of Chicago and uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. What they did was that they thought that the people were focused on just the fads of the day, and they did not have the proper perspective of the entire Western tradition. So they wanted to make it accessible to everybody. So they collected all the philosophers, scientists, psychologists, economists, um, novelists, everybody, all thinkers from initially from Homer to Freud, and they had this giant book set, okay? What is called the great books. But the thing that they did, which I thought was really, really amazing, is that they asked a very simple question. They asked, what do these people talk about? And they identified these 103 great ideas, okay? And they have these nice little essays, about 10 page essays that summarize what everybody has said, everybody in history has said about the idea. And the purpose of that, um, and this is why, why they did it, is that they think that you take that in on your own, think about it as a starting point, as a springboard for your thinking. And I discovered, when I discovered this, I was completely you know, taken by it. So I spent three years along with a friend going through each and every one of those ideas, making you know, 
scratching. I, I, have, I have a well-worn copy of it, which is all uh, crumpled up. We looked at every idea and so what we thought. And Michael, you might, you might be interested in knowing, I launched my meetups. My original name of the meetups were 103 Great Ideas. Wow. And I went through 50 of those ideas. So one of the reasons it became popular is that was what it, it was. I would summarize all the things that people had said about an idea. We went through almost 50 of these ideas. Um, I, I would ask for vote, you know, I would uh, I ask people to vote which ideas they want to discuss. I would take the top three and I would each week would take an idea and then I would identify all the big questions that people had asked because I always think in terms of questions. And then this entire group of maybe 50 people on an average would chime in about what they thought. Uh, about that. Um, I'm also a big fan of how to read a book. I've done five meetups on how to read a book, including two on, on YouTube now. Um, so I'm exactly on the same line. And I don't see, I, I don't think that this is particularly special. I think, you know, if you don't know the base of ideas, how can you build anything on it? So that's like the beginning of saying, okay, and that allows you to actually challenge all your ideas, think about all your ideas. So that's, so I, uh, Michael, it is so delightful to talk about this. So I, I don't know if I can get it, but yes. yeah, in my book, I have a, a genealogy of the great books programs. And I didn't know you were, as it were, an insider, Srikant, that yes. there, there is a huge community of people who love this world. And, and just to talk, a, I agree with everything you said and to riff on a few other elements, so the original uh, version of a liberal arts education that this tradition renews, and it's very much a tradition, the I make is um, you know, martial arts lineages. So I've also studied Tai Chi and anybody who's done any martial arts, you know that your, your martial arts master is the pinnacle of the best lineage ever. I, <laughs> pretty much all of them feel that way, but it's very much a lineage tradition as opposed to a, um, you know, this is the curriculum and this is the methodology. That's sort of a more contemporary education thing. I see this as a lineage tradition where the liberal arts are liberating. The whole idea is to free us. And part of it is to free us from the parochialism of time and place and being exposed to the range of ideas, in this case, Western civilization. Though St. John's now has an Eastern classics where they do something very similar for Eastern um, thought. And they've also piloting a Muslim classics for Muslim thought. But in each case, there's this long tradition of argument and debate and a huge range of ideas that were considered legitimate or possible. And I think part of the, um, part of the percept, the kind of framing of mo modern academia is that they're, you know, my sociology professor knows the truth and my political science professor knows the truth, but certainly with respect to ethics, political philosophy, ontology, epistemology, there've been lots of different perspectives and wherever one settles for one's personal beliefs, I think it's useful to be exposed to the range of different thought on these fundamental philosophical questions. And so for me, Srikant, that's, that's kind of the value of looking at this long history of thought because uh, you, know, you can call certain people in history crazy, but uh, you know, I wanna know what Kant thought and Hegel thought. I'm not a fan of German idealism, but um, having known what the German idealists thought it expands my horizons. By the way, the reason our school is called Expanse is expanding horizons. So it's all fitting together. So given that you, you are part of the tr tradition, Shrikant, um, I could go in a million different directions. Where, where do you wanna set me yes. loose? Uh, so firstly, I want to connect this with our meetups of what mm -hmm. we do, um, because what I, I think is that this is something, this is not just for education of the young. I think education is wasted on the young in many ways. Uh, I think, you know, we, we, are, we are lifelong learners by, by nature. If we are, you know, if you're developing as good human beings, we're lifelong learners. So what I'm doing in these meetups is that I'm getting ideas from everywhere, not only presenters, but ideas from everywhere. And the format is designed so that the ideas are presented, put on the table, and there are small group discussions on those and then people come back and talk about their takeaways and questions that they're walking away with. So it's a way, uh, and one of the things that we always do is what I, you know, using uh, Mortimer Adler's idea is we always look at things syntopically. So if we are talking about something, if I'm saying, okay, Michael is doing this, 
what am I doing which is like that? Or what, do, what else do I know that is like that? So for example, we have on Wednesdays, we do comprehensivist Wednesdays or polymath Wednesdays, which are explicitly focused on relating of multiple disciplines together. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, so, so this is what the meetups are about. The other part of it is that um, it is in terms of people. I think the old style of education is based on religion. It's like, you know, that there is a revealed world, like, you know, through, you know, uni universities, their, their lineage comes from monasteries, where there is a revealed world, which is there in a book. And then there is somebody who knows it. And the other people are kind of sitting down there. And they are simply, if they are lucky, they will absorb something that is coming their way. Whereas this is kind of almost like a learning circle, where each individual is trying, is learning on their own, they are speaking their mind. That's another huge deal of speaking. Um, because what happens is that when you speak things out or when you write things out, you explicate the ideas, make them objective where other person can listen to it and they will say, oh, I don't understand this. Or, I don't agree with this. And then you take that into account. That feedback is crucial for learning. So I think the interaction is another thing that we do. Go ahead, sir. Oh, it's, it's huge. Can, um, now I know why Tom connected us. Uh, so many points of connection. So first of all, um, you know, my goal as an educator is to help students develop their whole cognitive intellectual belief framework. Um, often I say the real curriculum of my secondary schools is the conscious cultivation of personal identity, which is a mouthful, but I think that each of us should, and I think adolescents need to, come to terms with what they believe about truth, justice, goodness, beauty, honor. And my job is not to tell them what to believe. My job is as a midwife, Socratic midwife, to help them explore these ideas. And then as a consequence, they come out of school much stronger, more confident, more capable of articulating their own perspective in any context. And just to map this onto the business world, most of us in um, our professional lives certainly educated people spend their lives in meetings, probably not too many hours of meetings a week, but you know, you are in situations where you need to develop your ideas and speak your ideas. And even if it's, you know, you know, a strategy, a business strategy, or even tactics meeting, if you can't articulate your ideas in real time, you're at a disadvantage. And I would say the advantage of that students have from doing this, in my case, for seven years from sixth grade through 12th grade, is they're very comfortable making an argument in real time. And just to talk to the cognitive side of this a little bit, if they were reading a text and discussing it, imagine the cognitive complexity involved, because if you get really good at this, you're understanding what the author means. What does Plato mean by this? You're also understanding what Srikant is saying. Oh, Srikant is saying this about Plato. You're also making your own thoughts. Well, this is what I think about it. And ideally, you're developing a cognitive map of every participant's ideas in the room, comparing it to your own map of what the text is saying, comparing it with your own map of what your beliefs, your own personal beliefs are, and then engaging in real time in an articulate manner. So when I sometimes I go into classrooms and you know they're gifted students who think they're too smart to you know discuss ideas with the hoi polloi, the regular students, and I make the case: look, if you're really good at this you have to have this very complex cognitive model going on. And to add all the cognitive stuff, ideally you're also socially, emotionally aware of who's shy, who's intimidated, who's angry and whatever. And basically to do a good job of participating in a real time intellectual conversation, um, almost unlimited cognitive demands. But that's fun because again, I see, you know, one way of interpreting my career is I had so much fun doing this that I selfishly chose to create schools where I could continue doing this and train students to continue doing this. Um, yeah, and I've had a blast. Uh, give you one more anecdote and then I'll let you interject again, Srikant. So for me, thinking and talking about ideas is life. I'm pretty much never off. If I go to a party and there are a bunch of people talking about gossip or something, I always look for the person in the corner who wants to talk about ideas and we go and talk about ideas. And the first date was my wife. I was asking her questions all throughout, you know, we had fancy French restaurant and I'm asking her questions. She said, you're giving me a headache. What are you doing? So it didn't go well at first. Now, of course, she married me. She loves me. We talk about ideas all the time. 
And so I see once one has entered this world of thinking and talking about ideas, it's just a really wonderful, joyous way to live. So I'll pause there and uh, pass it back uh, to you. Yeah, this is amazing. So Michael, there is just so much to talk about, but here is a line that I was thinking of. Uh, first, Socrates, Montessori, and then your work, because mm -hmm. Socrates is really the kind of first person in history who mm -hmm. came up with this method, which is a radical departure from, uh, from the way in which people use the mind before. Um, and so I think Socratic is, that's one thing. Uh, the second, and which is the heart of your book. Um, the second one is I want to talk briefly about Montessori and what Montessori does for education, because I think it's a completely different philosophy and it's the most powerful philosophy that I know. Um, mm -hmm. And then I want to talk about how do you deal with, uh, I have my friend uh, Rupali here who runs a Montessori school um, and she's very familiar with how Montessori, how Montessori applies this philosophy to the two, you know, three to six year old, but most Montessori schools actually fail when they go beyond that. So I'm very curious about this. So those three steps, I think that seems to be a very good way of talking about this. Does that make Terrific. sense? Yeah, okay. totally makes sense. So let's dive into the Socrates piece because the Socrates piece is big. Um, first of all, you know, Alfred North Whitehead famously said that all of Western philosophy could be described as a series of footnotes to Plato. And, and what he means by that, or what I interpret him to mean by that, is that you know, once you start asking open-ended questions about what is true, what is good, what is justice, and so forth, it turns out it's very difficult to come up with consistent, coherent understandings of these things. And as a consequence, you get all of the philosophers arguing about different theories of truth, being, justice, goodness, and so forth. Um, and a key piece that I think Socrates, we don't know if it's Socrates or Plato who contributed it, is the consistent and coherent. Because um, for me, the core of Socratic dialogue is that I assume that you, Sri Kant, and of course, I'm just using you as an example, have a consistent, coherent under understanding of reality. And I assume that I do, but when we start talking about something, oh, you believe that justice is like this, but I believe justice is like this. Anytime there's a discrepancy, there's an opportunity to figure out why our, concept, our concepts are not aligned. And then we see what's coherent and consistent, in my version, your version, and then how to reconcile them. And I think that this search for consistent, coherent understanding is not only the foundation of Western philosophy, but really the foundation of Western civilization. You know, Galileo is, wait, if the earth moves around the sun, um, you know, shouldn't we find evidence of motion? And uh, he starts looking at pendula and, you know, examining the implications of movement and gets very granular about it. Um, you know, if we believe that every human soul has value, and there's a, both a Platonist version of that and a Christian version of that, then wait, how is it that we're enslaving these people? There's kind of an inconsistency there. And so I see this urge to come up with consistent, coherent understanding and a respectful dialogue over thousands of years in which this happens as incredibly generative. And then kind of to back up before Socrates a little bit, there's a wonderful book by a man named James Dorn called The Geography of Science. And he makes the case that speculative thought began in Greece or developed in Greece in part because elsewhere there were math and science, math and science developed, but they were all in the service of hydraulic kingdoms. So that whether it's in China or India or Egypt or even Mesoamerica, yes, there was math and science, but you know, by hydraulic kingdoms, you know, irrigation, when is the river gonna flood? And thus we need to become sophisticated about um, you know, calendars and astronomy and so forth. And then how much is it gonna flood? And you know, we need to figure out land and all of that. So there was a very practical, but also centralized, top-down centralized, you know, in Egypt, uh, if you're a, a mathematician in Egypt, you're basically in service of the Pharaoh. Whereas um, in Greece, you've got all these little tiny islands and you've got all these little tiny city states and you get this situation where people have conflicting beliefs in different cities and they're talking and traveling together. Um, another reference, I'm a big fan of Julian Jaynes, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Glad to see you smiling there, Shrikant. I, uh, I just want to tell you that um, Martin uh, Kaustin, who is the head of the Julian Jaynes Society, 
is will be talking on this Tuesday here. He'll, he'll be oh my. at 9 p.m. So please, wow. uh, you're welcome. So let me give you my James 101 and connect it to so Socrates, and then we can do a little bit of dialogue and go on to Montessori. So, you know, Julian James um, has this amazing notion, and it's a beautiful book. I think uh, Origin of Consciousness is a beautiful book. Even if you disagree with every aspect, it's just beautifully written. But he talks about how originally we, our brains are designed to submit to authority and even hear the voice of authority. So whether it's the gods or the leader of our tribe or community or whoever, um, we hear this voice and that moral voice kind of creates cohesiveness in the tribe. Um, but what happens when we start hearing disagreeing moral voices? So I go back, Srikant, actually to Antigone. I, I see Antigone as an interesting uh, precedent for Socrates, where on the one hand, you've got the voice that says, uh, our custom is to bury the dead, and that's absolute. And then she's also got this custom that says, respect the king, the king Creon. And so what do I do? And you can read Antigone as on the one hand, the voice of authority saying, I must bury my dead brother. On the other hand, the voice of authority in saying, I've been told not to dare to bury my dead brother. And the internal conflicts, Julian James talks about the um, you know, corpus callosum connecting the left and right hemispheres. And I, I always visualize now, um, you know, neuronal traffic going across the corpus callosum when we don't know what's right or wrong and we have to adjudicate between different uh, claims of right or wrong. And so I see, you know, Greece with all of these different belief systems arguing with each other. And surely this to some extent took place across the Mediterranean. But, um, you know, again, in Egypt, what the Pharaoh says totally rules. Whereas in Greece, you've got these philosophers going from island to island with all these crazy speculative beliefs. And this um, constant process of different people making different truth claims about fundamental belief systems led to the extraordinary efflorescence of Greece and of classical Periclean Athens. And Socrates sort of formalized the technique as articulated by Plato of asking questions for the consistent, coherent understanding of truth. So I'll pause there because uh, imagine wow. some of those things resonated for you, Shrikant. Wow, well, no, this is, this is incredible. Um, this is incredible. Um, the thing about Socrates that stands out for me is questions of, firstly, the courage to question anything, not being afraid to question anything, and having the humility of saying, I don't know. Uh, both of which seem very simple things, but those are the causes of actually learning rather than simply pretending to know. Yeah, and, and just to go back to many people, you know, Socrates was put to death for um, corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods of the state. And of course, I've known many intellectuals who think, oh, those dumb Athenians, they put the great Socrates to death. Uh, going from a different perspective, there's a recent book by a man named Joseph Henricks called The Secrets of Our Success. I think it's a brilliant book about how deeply embedded um, culture, and he, he goes into the role of culture and evolution and how we evolved in some ways to preserve cultures. And so uh, while I, as a 21st century intellectual, can be glib about question everything, I think in many respects, questioning everything is perceived as dangerous, um, that there is a natural conservatism that says we should respect our ancestors, we should respect the norms of the community. And I think that, you know, going back to the Jane's piece, when you have contradicting, uh, you know, traditions, moral authorities, what do you do? And right, the Socratic thing is to break it open and say, let's just keep questioning and see if we can figure it out with the humility being once one has standards of logic, and what we haven't gone into is the relationship of mathematics to philosophical reasoning, but in parallel to the development of Socratic reasoning was a very sophisticated development of mathematics, which by the way, I buy the notion that Pythagoras may have gone to Indians. There may be an ancient Indian Pythagorean connection, um, but you know, this rationality as instantiated in mathematics on the one hand and rational argumentation on the other, then provided grounds for, you know, endless questioning. Because again, with anything sophisticated, uh, you've got enough experience to know it, there's no simple, there are no simple correct answers. So even if we want to submit to authority and say, okay, boss, that's the right thing. In the back of our head, there's this nagging, but, 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 you know, and, and that constant, um, but what about X is what drives inquiry and progress.
absolutely. Uh, I wanted to add just one thing. I mean, in uh, your, I really like your pointing out that asking questions can be unsettling to the society, but it's also unsettling to yourself because there is a pension in human beings for certainty. To question, no, go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, some people have described St. John's as four years of having your most sacred beliefs ripped to shreds week after week after week after week. And um, yeah, for, you know, it's been my way of life for deca decades, so it's no longer unsettling to me. But uh, I, I do remember, you know, even just going to Midwestern classrooms. I, I, for a while, I was doing public school demonstrations of Socratic seminars. And, um, you know, I remember going to these nice Midwestern classrooms where people have stable religious belief systems. And I felt a little bit badly, you know, asking questions that, you know, undermined uh, a comfortable belief system. And so I, I realized that a lot of people uh, develop a huge amount of comfort from their existing belief system, whatever. Um, and so, but once one begins questioning, I think then it's, you don't turn back. I think once you begin questioning, it's, you're basically launched on a philosophical life. And, um, you know, I don't want to force it on anybody, but anybody who's ready, I'm very eager to, let's, let's join the philosophical journey together. No, I, I think it's a huge thing. For example, in this meetup, this is kind of the part of the ethos that you, you know, people hold different views, but people should be free to express their views, disagree with anybody and doing so courteously, listening to the other person. Um, and that is rare because it's only when you're ready to question yourself and uh, others that you can have this kind of peaceful, thoughtful dialogue. Otherwise you have the phenomena of saying, I believe this and the other person is a monster for not believing that. And there is no way, unless you have this ability to ask questions to reason and to talk to one another, you do not have a way of achieving peace and working together. Big time. Uh, I often say when I go into say a middle school classroom, I love middle schoolers, they're very energetic and um, they're all over the place. They're bouncy is the way I describe them, you know, physically, emotionally, intellectually, middle schoolers just, you know, if you ever feel like you'd like to be around inner schoolers, you know, tons of, Say that when I'm introducing them to Socratic, in some ways I'm getting them to the point where person A speaks, person B listens and thinks about it and replies. And it sounds simple, but um, you know, when I first go in, just okay, Srikant said this, Becky said that. How do those things relate? I feel picture as if I'm gently putting threads together to create a little coherent conversation. Because without, they're all kind of little solipsists and they'll all have their own popcorn views and no connection at all. Or when they do connect, you're right, they can be angry and aggressive towards each other. So there's this gentle craft of pulling it together. Just somebody who uh, has asked in the, the comment in law using the Socratic method. So Paper Chase, uh, the film from the 1970s showing law school Socratic, I would say is kind of aggressive. Um, I, again, I compare it to martial arts. On the one hand, you have sort of karate style hard martial arts. On the other hand, you have Tai Chi gentle style martial arts. I would say I practice gentle, soft style Socratic, where I'm very gentle and respectful. Whereas, yeah, there are people who are kind of aggressive attack style Socratic. And even within the Platonic dialogues, to be fair, sometimes Socrates is more aggressive and disrespectful with some interlocutors, whereas, say, Theotetus. Theotetus, which is not a well-known dialogue, is one where he's actually very respectful to Theotetus, who happens to be a brilliant mathematics student. So if you want to see um, a, a different style of Socrates, uh, read the Theotetus. But go ahead, Srikant. Again, we, we can shift to Montessori whenever you want, but we can go into Socrates as long and Absolutely. as deeply as you want. Absolutely. Let's do one thing. Uh, with the questions, we will handle them in the Q&A because I want okay. to lay out the kind of main core of what, what your thought for, yep. so that we, we cover that. And then we will yep. go on to all kinds of other questions. Uh, I wanna have tons of questions. That's always always the case. Wonderful. Um, so now let's, I wanna go uh, now go into education, education of children, okay? Mm -hmm. And on that, you know, for me, experience of discovering Montessori has been profoundly transforming because the way I see it, Montessori actually has a different view of children 
she regards children as independent beings who are cap capable of learning on their own. And the function of the teacher as creating the environment in which they can learn and be there as a guide when needed. So it is not the teacher who is giving the education, but it's an independent being who is learning by interacting with the world. Um, so it is a profoundly different view of, of a child. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I have huge respect for Montessori. And um, one of the things that I think that I take away from Montessori the most is her insight. And I think it's a brilliant insight that education is a matter of creating a prepared environment in her language or environment in our language. Often people who are attracted focused on the particular objects in the classroom. You know, the pink tower is a famous one, but Montessori is famous for creating these uh, various materials in her classroom. But I think more fundamental than the particular materials that she created a hundred years ago is her insight that if you design the environment in the right and work with freedom and be incredibly productive. And she also, by the way, was very uh, an acute observer on the role of the adult as part of the environment. So she has all sorts of advice to how to behave as a guide in a Montessori classroom um, that is designed so that the guide is a healthy, positive uh, dimension of the environment. And I don't, I'm not sure if I can think of anybody else who is as an acute an observer with her as she is on that. And one of the reasons I think that's the exciting insight for me in Montessori is I certainly reject schooling. So um, there are a couple of Stanford scholars, Tayak and Cuban, who talk about the grammar of schooling. They point out that um, almost around the world at this point, there's a grammar of schooling where there's a third grade and a fourth grade and a fifth grade. And there is a curriculum for third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade. And there are assessments associated with that. And you know, there's a whole apparatus. And right away, if one wants to allow children to be free um, and follow the child, a Montessori expression, they might not follow the third grade curriculum. They might you know, be four years advanced in reading and two years behind in math. They might spend history and a year studying science. You know, there are different dimensions. And so as soon as one is locked into the grammar of schooling, one can't actually fulfill a Montessori vision. There are Montessori public schools and charter schools that try to do it, but I think it's fair to say most of them are frustrated and wish they had more freedom within the system. And going beyond that, um, just something obvious is competency-based uh, learning. So competency-based learning is, you know, if you have completed seventh grade math the first two weeks of seventh grade, uh, take a test and work on eighth grade and so forth. You know, the, the notion we should spend a whole year doing what's in the curriculum, or if you need two years to do seventh grade math, take two years. That is um, learning at whatever is right for your uh, achievement of competency. I see it as a natural direction education should go and the grammar of schooling essentially prevents it. Whereas Montessori allows a structure that's radically individualized. If every child can pursue his or her own interests within an environment, then yeah, you can have kids at different places. Um, the other piece of this, going back to something else you said, Srikant, is Montessori said, the sign of success of a teacher is when they're working as if I'm not there. And in a great Montessori classroom, you don't see the teacher. The teacher might be off doing something else. Most of the kids, most of the time, are working with incredible focus and diligence on their work without, as it were, supervision or guidance. They've kind of internal, internalized. Montessori talks about normalization. And I would say that's very much my goal as an educator, that when I, I feel as if I'm most successful as an educator, when in the case of Socratic, kids are thinking, talking, and arguing about ideas without me, they have no need of me, they're totally on their own. Finally, to talk about the prepared environment thing, if we reject the grammar of schooling, then there are many people who are now in favor of um, self-directed democratic schooling, that sort of thing. And while I'm sympathetic to many of those people and have many friends on that side of the movement, I wish and I constantly urge them to talk more about culture, community, and the environment. That is, I think the unschooling does really well when you know, it's a certain kind of environment, uh, often you know, an educated adult or somebody who simply engages kids in conversation, somebody with lots of enthusiasms. There's lots of cool stuff for the kids to do. I think if we created an environment where kids didn't had nothing, no books to read, no games to play, 
uh, but video games, then they all they would do is play video games. And so um, I see Montessori's insight as let's create an environment within which freedom has positive outcomes. And for all of those rejecting school um, to go beyond Montessori, I wanna see a vibrant um, global community of people talking about this is how to curate great environment and variations. So I'm kind of loving Montessori and wanting to go beyond Montessori in that particular way. Absolutely. So this this is a great point of transition because actually, I mean, I have found the same thing that Montessori did a brilliant job of identifying the prepared environment needed for that age group of three to six. And very few people have been able to do anything. Many people call, there are schools that call themselves Montessori uh, in much later years but they don't have anything near that. So I'm gonna let uh, a friend of mine who runs a Montessori school ask that question about uh, the, these kind of principles applied to later. So Rupali, I'm uh, pleased to uh, introduce Rupali. She runs a Montessori school in um, Massachusetts and uh, she has spoken about Montessori here. So uh, Rupali, go ahead and ask your question. Sure, thank you, Srikant, and thank you, uh, Michael, uh, for your information. This is extremely uh, interesting. So um, our school, I mean, for most Montessori schools, they are uh, kindergarten, up to kindergarten or elementary schools. And then when you're looking at the adolescent and uh, high school students, um, how do you apply those same principles of autonomy, of independent thinking, of the prepared environment, and most importantly, the prepared adult uh, to that age group. No, that's a back up, and you'd mentioned three to six, Srikant. I think of it as a work of absolute. That, that's where she started, but it's also the pinnacle of her achievement. I think a well run classroom is a work of absolute genius and every educated adult should go and observe Montessori uh, classroom. It's just so incredible. I would say going into and then adolescent or elementary school is broken into lower L and upper L. And I would say lower elementary works pretty much as well as the children's house. Um, but upper L already, and this is kind of probably getting into the considerations with adolescents, upper L works pretty well, but not as well as lower L. And I would say there are a couple of places where it's beginning to break down that then show where we need to go in later education. One is the children have become so much more social. So, you know, in three to six, the kids are happy working silently. They'll sit next to each other, you know, most all day working on their little things. Low rel are starting to talk more to each other. By up rel, man, they want to talk with each other all the time. So one thing, and just to bring in the Socratic, one thing that's great about the Socratic is a compliment to Montessori is Hello, kids want to talk? Let's talk, you know? So we have an environment in which the talking is validated and nourished. And so, yeah, even with UPREL, I start doing a fair bit of Socratics. I've done Socratics with children down to three years old, although they're 15 minutes. I actually have a, a series of YouTube, a young woman named Alana, where I started doing Socratics with her online at the age of four, and she is now eight. And so if you want to see the development a, of a young woman from it's out there. But yeah, by, by upper L, they need this social interaction. The other thing is concrete abstract. So Montessori famously so kids could have concrete experiences, but as children get older, abstract uh, thought becomes more important. And to some extent, this is the case in upper L, even more so in middle school. So, you know, secondary Montessori, a huge topic, just for people who are not familiar, Maria Montessori herself started with up through elementary and down, you know, the well-developed Montessori structure from infant all the way through upper elementary. With middle school, I say called Erdkinder, Earth Child, and it pro proposes a farm school where kids and do a bed and break care of things. I think it's wonderful school, um, a Hershey school actually doing this. I think this is relatively few parents are ready to send their 11 year olds away to a farm. Um, so Rupali is involved in a discussion with the AMI leadership on versus what they dismissively called the urban compromise. Um, you know, that, that shows how AMI was thinking of uh, at the time. But 
she, again, she had this great framework. I would say Val talks about is valorization is one of the needs for the teenager to feel as if they're important in society. And I think that's something that our existing system does not do well at all. So part of the thinking when Montessori proposed this farm school where kids are raising crops and uh, running an Airbnb bed and breakfast was that the kids would roles in the function of society. She also talks about a micro economy and so forth. And to connect this to another strand of thought, I'm a big fan of um, human evolution and evolutionary psychology. And I think uh, in traditional cultures, you know, young people took on 12, often there would be a rite of passage and, um, you know, a young man would be expected to go out and hunt his first deer or antelope or whatever. And then they were inducted in society and, you know, the 12, 13 year old boys would go with the men and the 12, 13 year old girls would go with the women and do an adult. Much of the pathology, I do, I regard adolescence in the United States as a catastrophe with extraordinary levels of anxiety, depression, suicide, self-harm, um, eating disorders, you name it, uh, addiction, substance abuse. Uh, I've, I've worked with teens and, um, you know, my wife happens to be from Senegal. Teens in Senegal have none of this. You know, they're mostly healthy and well. The United States um, are falling apart. And I think a lot of this is we evolved to take on responsibility for year olds uh, infantilized. And I see a, playing a path, you're expected to sit and take notes while a teacher tells you what to do all day under fluorescent lights. I think that's egregiously harmful to, uh, and we're damaging large numbers of kids by putting them in that environment. Conversely, again, Montessori's vision is valid. So if we're not doing that in a farm school, what do we do? A big part of my secondary program consists of purpose-driven projects. So we coach and often those projects into real world work. So my, I want an adolescent to do adult level work. To give you a couple of examples, I've had teens, I had a teen who did the website for an American Idol finalist. I had another teen who Kaiser Permanente, which is used as part of their corporate trainings. I had a teen do a three-day music festival. He was, uh, as a 10th grader, he began promoting concerts, renting venues, uh, selling tickets, you know, booking bands. By senior year, $80,000 budget, bands from around the world flew to his festival. So my template, this is software, fiction, author, you know, articles, you name it. So my goal going back to how do we do this, is this deep commitment to valorization, having young people take on as quickly as possible something like adult roles in their society. Mm -hmm. You know, typically at 12, they're not ready, but yeah, by the time they're 15, 16, 17, let's do it. Go ahead, Shrikan. Uh, you're saying, uh, you're using the word of valorization? Uh, so, uh, sorry, um, um, there's a problem with your internet. Uh, is there anything else playing on the internet that you can reduce or something like that? Uh, there are breaks in what Some, you uh, Yeah, I, I often have way too many, you know, browsers and windows and so forth open. So let me get rid of a lot of stuff. Them, yeah. Can so you hear me better? I, yeah. Go ahead. I think valorization is such a big part of the Montessori adolescent program and the idea that children should have a purpose, that who am I and why am I here uh, is a big part of leading them into adulthood where they can be meaningful participants of uh, you know, their community. Um, how, how do you lead children to valorization? How do you develop them into independent thinkers especially when the traditional system is more um, top-down where they are asked to do things where they're not thinking for themselves. So how um, in adolescent ages, when you mention how they're on that emotional roller coaster, uh, they're very social, how do you bring that? Uh, no, great question. So th this is a good time to kind of go into the details of what I do because um, so Expanse Online, my current program, it's a virtual secondary program, but it's modeled at what I did at the Academy of Thought and Industry. 
Um, for the Academy of Thought and Industry, I created a Montessori high school for the largest Montessori organization in the US. Higher ground education as you know, 60 or 70, they're constantly growing, might be 80 at this point. Schools, Montessori schools across the US. And I created the high school model for them. But the basic structure of Expanse is, uh, I'll be very concrete, so it's 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. Um, we do half an hour of community every morning, and part of the purpose of community is to build community. You know, it's funny, there's been a whole wave of people talking about social and emotional learning in schools, and sometimes they actually give lessons in social and emotional learning, which I regard as mostly crazy. I see social emotional learning as having this healthy social emotional relationship. A session where we provide a variety of games, activities, conversations. Um, we talk about our intentions for the week. And this gets into uh, um, you know, how to think about developing purpose. So Rupali, just to the most basic notion, a weekly ritual of what are you gonna do this week? What are you gonna try to achieve this week? Not heavy initially, it's just, uh, a standard expectation in our culture that you're going to get something done this week, that you own your own education. Um, we also, at the end of the week, have uh, announcements, apologies, and appreciations. So many elementary schools have appreciation circles. Uh, way fewer secondary schools have appreciation. Um, you know, some adult workplaces are appreciative, but um, many secondary schools are kind of cynical and negative all the time. So no, we have a culture where part of our community is appreciating each other. Um, so after a community every morning, then we have an hour of Socratic where we read, think, talk about ideas and going to flipping it around with Polly. Um, the great thing about Socratic is we read, you know, Plato or Buber or, you know, whatever conversation. So at the end of it, um, my job is not to teach you what the author thought, it's to ask questions to get you thinking. And then after Socratic, we have the students write. And the students typically want to write about what we talked about, because if we just have an argument where Rupali thinks Montessori is great and Srikant thinks it's terrible, and you say, no, it's great because of A, B, and C, and Srikant says, no, it's terrible because of X, Y, and Z. That Most students hate essay writing in school. But if you've just been arguing about something, it's pretty easy to go and boom, 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 boom. And this doesn't happen overnight, but you know, this constant log followed by, you know, students reading and writing. So just connecting this to the, um, you know, a lot of the conventionality of sex are anxious and freaked out about high school and all that. So, uh, I've had great SAT verbal gains in my students because of material every day and arguing about it. Hello, that's what the SAT verbal is. If you look at it, it's a sophisticated verbal paragraph, nuanced questions. You do that for seven years, SAT verbal is a piece of cake. You know, essay writing, another big one. Again, if instead of essay writing being this weirdo thing that your English teacher write an essay on the symbolism of, you know, the Mississippi River and, you know, cares, you know, but if they've been arguing and they're writing essays where they're arguing with their friends all the time, yeah, the essay writing develops, we coach it personally, we have great essayers, essay writers. Um, so that's the morning community followed by Socratic Humanities. Um, then we have an hour off for lunch, good to have afternoon. We're using a curriculum by an organization called Quantum Camp, which designed it for homeschoolers in the Bay Area. So pretty sophisticated, intellectually savvy parents in the Bay Area. It's kind of a great books approach to um, science and math. Um, I would say it has students go through a lot of very simple experiments in science and some foundational material in math. It's at once uh, accessible to middle schoolers as well as conceptually sophisticated. And that's kind of a longer conversation but I would say one of the goals when I pick Socratic readings is for things to be accessible but conceptually sophisticated. You know, with your Socratic background, that should make sense. So math and science, they do that. And if students want to be do more math and science, we can also provide individual math and science via ed tech. So one way we, I, I'm very big on the human to human connection and things. And ed tech will allow if a student wants to. I had one student actually do four years of math in one year doing, um, um, it's online, Re Rebecca. So there's in person in San Francisco, Austin, 
New York and St. Louis, Expansion is online. And one of the reasons I created Expanse is lower cost. So Expanse is 8,000 a year. Um, Academy of Thought and Industry is 50K in New York, 40K in San Francisco. Um, so that's the science and math. And then we have uh, uh, another partner called Nobel Explorers, which is international students of say 10 kids from around the world, um, Ukraine, Kenya, together in a three week period and build a website or do a little data analysis or cool uh, projects that they do. And so it's project-based learning, it's international, it's still. Um, I also have an art class and my art goes from traditional drawing, so rigorous uh, how to draw in the most basic way, on through animation, on through creating your own YouTube channel. So, you know, so if kids, you know, uh, painting or whatnot, they can. Our art curriculum is soup to nuts, how to draw all the way to how to create a channel. And so again, real world project sort of orientation. Um, of it. And the way we get into college, one more piece. So college admissions, again, turns out only 3% of American students go to competitive colleges. So um, the fact that today are desperate for students, uh, secret and into college, they want to go to Harvard or Stanford, different thing. But even there, um, in order to, you know, sorry about the hearing, maybe um, in order to get into an elite college, there's a wonderful author, Cal Newport, How to Be a High School Superstar. And he has something similar to my perspective, which is great projects are a huge college admissions asset. So we do nail the SAT, so our kids have great SAT verbal, didn't go deeply into the SAT math, verbal and math for students who are academically ambitious. Um, one of the things we do is we have students take on a volunteer basis, free Khan Academy SAT starting in ninth grade, and we coach them. So if your kid is academically ambitious and in ninth grade, their SAT verbal or math are not where they want to get them, then you've got four years. It turns out if you have four years to develop your SAT scores, not a big deal. A lot of the anxiety around SAT is senior year, I don't like my SAT scores, oh no, test prep, all of that. But instead, long gradual development of fundamental math and verbal skills to do well on the SAT. Then I recommend students that are academically ambitious take maybe three AP courses. And if you're only taking three AP courses, maybe one ninth grade, one 10th grade, one 11th grade, it's not a drag. I mean, a lot of the animus against, uh, you know, the getting into competitive colleges is these kids taking 10 to 15 AP courses, they're stressed out doing homework. No, if you have a kid who has scored a four or five on three AP courses, who has high SAT scores and has done a dazzling project, they're competitive for getting into a an elite college. Now, obviously how amazing the project is makes a difference, but I always like to focus on that path so that parents can be less anxious. Give you just a um, couple of examples. Um, when I went to Harvard years ago, the kid with the lowest SAT scores in my class had been elected mayor of a small town in Michigan at the age of 18. If your kid can get himself or herself elected mayor at 18, SAT scores don't matter. Different kind of thing, but I have a, um, a student in my network now who was an HBO actor. He was an uh, actor in an HBO series, and he got into Harvard. You know, again, great SAT scores, but he didn't take all these conventional classes. Harvard wants a kid who's a successful uh, actor and who scores well on tests. So as long as your kid is doing amazing stuff and they can prove their academic bona fides, they're, they're good. Go ahead, somebody had a question, maybe it's Srikant. All right, this is this is excellent. Now, what I, what I want to do is that I want to give an opportunity for uh, all our members to ask questions. Uh, so folks, um, you can, so the plan now is we're going to do questions for a short time, then we're going to do breakout rooms uh, for 20 minutes, and then we get to come back. Uh, in the breakout rooms, we get to discuss everything that Michael has been saying. See, I can talk to Michael forever, it looks like, okay? But I want to give a chance for everybody to ask questions. So folks, um, as usual, we've got four rules. Go ahead and type exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask questions. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. And number four, feel free to disagree with anybody on anything. 
and do so courteously. Uh, next up is uh, Sharon, Trevor, and Kevin. Sharon, go ahead. Hi, Michael. Uh, great presentation. Can you please comment on teaching law using the Socratic method? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, there's a paradigm in law that is aggressive about it, but um, it doesn't need to be aggressive. It could be gentler. But the idea is that in law, one needs to master a large number of cases and how these cases relate to each other. And it's fundamentally about arguing. Actually, even in my secondary schools, we often do Supreme Court cases and uh, the students read and we discuss the arguments presented both um, agreeing with and disagreeing with the Supreme Court decision. So I see law as a place where reading, thinking, arguing about ideas is normal. Um, and at law schools, it's completely appropriate to have the kind of Socratic discussions leading to sophisticated arguments that are based on legal principles and precedents. Uh, folks, uh, so it's going to be Trevor, Kevin, and Jyoti next. Folks, uh, at this point, just keep, uh, keep it to questions. What we'll do is that after the breakout rooms, you will have a chance to talk about your takeaways. And there you can put anything that you want. You can say anything that you want. But this time, it's questions so we can get to as many questions as we uh, can. Trevor, you're next. Hi, Michael. Um, thanks. This was probably the greatest talk. I mean, the ideas that you're addressing here. Um, you know, I think a lot about the state of the world and I, and I look at across the entire spectrum and everywhere I look, it's low dimensional thinking, simplistic, uh, you know, bordering on dishonest narrative perspectives. E even among the experts, it's, it's, I almost can't believe reality is real. It's so absurd. So uh, I've, I spent half your talk writing down questions. I have about 10 questions, I can't ask them. So my first question is, is it possible that if there's others like me that we can email you questions and then follow up at a later date? Number Absolutely. Two, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm evangelical about this, so always on, go ahead. Okay, because I mean, you know, you are talking exactly about the approach that I think needs to be taken to fix the world in the absurd state it's in. Uh, number two, I have an 11 year old daughter. I want her to end up like you. Is there anything online, like online courses that she can take on a part-time basis? Uh, like, it, it, I don't think I can completely, well, maybe I could convince her to homeschool in one of your schools or something, but is there something from a part-time basis? Yes, 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 there is. Um, and email me. I also wrote an essay on how to give your child an expensive private education for $3,000 a year, which is similar to this. So especially, yeah, if you've got an 11 year old daughter, let's talk. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go deep. Wonderful. Um, uh, Michael, could you put your email in the, um, in the chat so that they, yeah. everybody who wants to contact you can do that. Next yeah. up is going to be Kevin, Jyoti and Rebecca. Kevin. Thank you, thank, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, you know, learn a lot and shared. Uh, my question seems we talk about the environment. Should we, uh, what kind of environment? My understanding is uh, like we need let's see, try and learn something. We need discussion, then make up question, then build knowledge mapping or knowledge tree. That's my question for you. Do you agree with that? Each knowledge that's current to our education. We have curriculum but we don't have between curriculum to executable component to a student's mind. How student get it, grab it and learn it, agree with it. That's we need the knowledge mapping that come up possible. That's both the uh, student and teacher next customized to the self. Student itself, they get a map. Then they should after you, each other build a own map, the understanding. Next would be explore next topic. Knowledge would be naturally come up. It's not from let's see, okay, then even guess it's no, not a wrong or right answer, but it's a track. It, as long as it's a different angle, then the learner as student, they're going to grab it right away. Do you agree so that's about the knowledge map? Um, so, I, I got a second question. Um, no, let's okay. do one question at a time. Okay, okay. that's about that. Okay, yeah. thank so you. I, I'm not a, sure I understood every uh, 
every piece of what you said, Kevin, but I'll do my best given what I did understand from what you asked. One is, you know, just in terms of a knowledge map. So my personal focus as an educator is very much on getting kids to read, think, and discuss ideas and not on the transmission of knowledge. And so that is a fairly radical break from the conventional system. I would say, by the way, that in say mathematics and much of science, children need to develop the capacity to problem solve, which is a, which is a different modality. So I see the ability to learn how to solve problems. Georg Polya's How to Solve It is a good foundational text there. Um, um, so solving problems is a huge, important additional strand to the Socratic trend. With respect to traditional schools and knowledge, I'll give you two examples. One is, um, I, I see the Socratic, the, I, I'm friends with somebody who talks about cognitive enablers. I see that uh, lighting the child, Ralph Waldo Emerson, I'm a fan of Emerson, his biography is called Mind on Fire. And I see part of what I'm doing is I want the children's minds to be on fire with curiosity, learning, um, and exploration of their understanding. So at one point I was working with a teacher, high school teacher who had taught the French Revolution for 17 years. And she had a three week unit on the French Revolution. Rather than go through her standard three week unit, I recommended that she spend um, two weeks reading and discussing Rousseau on inequality. And she was freaked out because I needed three weeks to cover everything. But what she found is when the kids have spent a lot of time reading, thinking, arguing about inequality, then when they get to the French Revolution and there are these sudden, everything's meaningful. So with the issue of inequality um, and their personal position on it fresh in their mind, then the not knowledge, as it were, of the French Revolution stuck. One description of education is like throwing spaghetti against the wall and most of it falls off. Most, most knowledge doesn't stick. Whereas if their minds are alive and on fire, then stuff sticks. Going in a different way, when I do teach advanced placement courses, which are content heavy, it turns out that, look at AP history courses, about um, value is in essay writing and half is in multiple questions. And it turns out that if a student aces, the way they're scored, if a student aces the essay questions, they can get all of the multiple choice questions wrong and still get a five. Or maybe uh, in some cases they're different, maybe just a few multiple choice. So I go heavy on the conceptual side, heavy on the sophisticated thinking side, crank up our students' ability to uh, well on the essay questions. I'll give you one concrete essay question. There's a document based that was, um, what's the relationship of um, cricket? So there were 10 little excerpts from paragraphs in 19th century newspapers, both British and Indian. And there were these little examples of the game of cricket and kind of attitudes around cricket. And then the goal was the student needed to write an essay on how colonialism impacted the game of cricket. That didn't require, you know, nobody was expected to know anything about cricket in 19th century India, but it required a sophisticated conceptual understanding of big picture. So in terms of knowledge, I find that A, the students are much more ready to understand knowledge if they've been thinking about issues than if not. And B, certainly in the humanities, again, outside of STEM, much of what we're expected to do is thinking anyway. I'll give you two more quick anecdotes and I'll go to the next question. One is there was at one point a Harvard student who did not take an anthropology course, but wanted to show that all it took was sophisticated thinking. So he showed up with a final exam in an anthropology course and got an A without going to one single class. Separately, I took a pedagogy class in Alaska for an alternative teaching pedagogy. I read the book the night before and I got the best score on a pedagogy exam in the entire it's often if you have a sophisticated conceptual understanding, the details are easy. Knowledge sticks. I um, just want to follow up on this one thing that Kevin asked. He was asking whether actually executing a project is an, should be an integral part of learning. So instead of just learning, learning and applying it to something, what, what do you think about that? So I, I would say, again, we have student projects all the way through. I, I think it's good. But on the other hand, we don't, and some of, part of this gets into um, what students. Uh, Mike, Michael, uh, there is a lot of problems. Let's try one thing. Uh, can you turn off your video? I'm sorry to do that, I'll, but I'll I think uh, people are not able to get, okay, perfect. Uh, go ahead, sir. What I'm saying is that um, 
we don't require students if the strategy for college admissions is say three AP courses, a great project course, we don't require that students specific knowledge. So if they want to master knowledge and apply it in order to master it, absolutely we support that. But we radically personalize and individualize the secondary track so much that it's not required of all students. Um, in one particular example, I had a student who scored poorly on cognitive tests, had severe dyslexia, but was a brilliant film editor. My goal was to help him become an amazing film editor. And so he did relatively military academics. But that's sort of a, a common pattern. Yes, application and projects are great, but not required. Got it. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jyoti, Rebecca, and Mike. Jyoti, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. My quick question to uh, Mike, uh, Mike, Michael is, I'm quite fascinated by your curriculum. It's very advanced and it's the wholesome. Uh, but do you have like a standardized test before they get to the SAT stage? Because in the public schools, every year, the children are, supposed, are required to take standardized tests. That's how they measure their uh, progress against the other state. So do you have something like that uh, in your school? So uh, I, th I think I got most of what you said, but the, the, the simple version is that our attitude towards testing is always opt-in. We're a, a private school and we have both an accredited and unaccredited. The accredited has more constraints, but I actually prefer the unaccredited because I can personalize more radically. Testing is, um, I'll give American Idol. So a lot of times testing makes children very anxious and all sorts of things happen as a result of that. On the other hand, if children want to go to competitive colleges, they absolutely need to nail testing. So part of our personal coaching, every child has 30 minutes of one-on-one -on -one coaching is even as early as sixth grade, do you want to be academically competitive? And when are you ready to be academically competitive? So we give children ownership over testing. So we're not forcing anybody to test. But when they're ready to test, then we're full on coaches. You want to go to MIT? This, this is and roll. Let's make this happen. American Idol is like an audition. You know, people will line up for long lines for an audition where they may be humiliated, but as long as they chose them. On the other hand, I think forcing children to fit into one size fits custody. So I think I'm unusual. A lot of avoid testing. I'm a realist. Hey, doing well on the SATs is incredibly valuable, but I want your agency involved. So, and no shame, no blame I for you is to be an entrepreneur and forget testing or a filmmaker and forget testing. I'm all in with you. My goal as an educator is to identify every child's genius and crank up that genius. And genius for an entrepreneur or filmmaker is different from genius for a scientist. That's okay. Wonderful, Michael. Uh, next up is going to be Rebecca, Mike, Rupali, and Matthew. Uh, Rebecca, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, Michael, I just want to say awesome work. Um, it's really exciting. I'm a true believer that academics needs an overhaul um, to bring us more into thinking and learning and interconnectedness. So this has just been really fascinating. Um, my question to you is around your thoughts on online versus in person. And obviously talking post COVID world, um, I see huge value in online being able to connect us with the rest of the world, the international perspectives, you know, the gained learning from other cultures. Um, however, I, I question that as a, as a 100% model because of the fact that we're living in community and we need to reshape our individual communities. And so there's things I feel like um, would be beneficial to some of the nonverbal, the team aspects, even the physical. Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies on interacting as teams and, you know, uh, let, uh, let, let uh, Michael respond. Uh, we're, we don't have that much time. So, so let Michael yeah. respond to that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Online. 
So first, Rebecca, I absolutely love in-person and there's a magic to create an in-person community that absolutely cannot be done online. Um, I would say the best uh, Montessori schools and Montessori middle schools and all, all sorts of alternative schools are warm, active, vibrant communities. And I want every child to have that opportunity. So I'm all in on the in-person. That said, the advantages uh, of doing it online are A, cheaper. Part of it is online, I don't need to have the real estate. Uh, you know, in San Francisco and Manhattan, real estate is really expensive. And then you have to pay teachers more because they have to live in these expensive cities. And then the other thing is, uh, as a school director dealing with teenagers, uh, in an in-person school, I have to manage you know, the kids making out in the bathroom, the kids bringing marijuana to school, the kids, you know, all the, all the things that kids do. So it's much simpler and cheaper for me to do online. That said, one way I envision Expanse moving is as we get, say, five to 10 kids in Miami or, or you know, Cincinnati or whatever, doing kind of in-person meetups and then organically going back to in-person physical communities. Um, one other piece I know a woman called um, Catherine Frace, who is based in Bethel, Connecticut, and she did something called Workspace, which was a learn, co-learning, co-working community where adults would come in with their kids and the adults would have an office and the kids would have um, different kinds of alternative learning opportunities. And it was just a magical place. So wherever we can do the in-person, absolutely, and much cheaper and simpler virtually. Um, I just want to uh, comment on that. I mean, uh, the same issue applies to my meetups. There is a magic to in-person uh, meeting and actually to, talking to people face-to-face. -face. So I had to go uh, online because I couldn't do in-person meetups. But once this is over, I'm, there is tremendous advantages to online because you can connect to people everywhere. And the kind of dialogue that you can have is incredible. So once uh, COVID goes away, I plan to do hybrid meetups where we have both in person and online. Now I have enough people in many, many, many cities. So we'll be able to do uh, you know, in person in addition to uh, continuing the online. Uh, next up is going to be Mike, Rupali and Matthew. And then we'll do the breakout rooms. Mike, question please. Question, uh, the Socratic method is, uh, is uh, proved very valuable and I assume that's the basis of yours and creates great people, great men and women of history. I, I think Socrates uh, was not interested in educating the masses. The traditional method is interested in ma educating the masses. Do you think uh, your method and other charter school methods that uh, uh, concentrate on nurturing the best ones, uh, the best, bring out the best of the best, is, uh, uh, will work uh, for the entire society? And uh, the traditional method uh, is interested in educating the masses and hoping that the great people will arise despite the process. Uh, I wonder what, uh, how you would apply your method to uh, the masses or not, or not. So first of all, um, I've, I've done hundreds, after I published my book, I, I was still doing public school consulting. And I did hundreds of demonstrations in classrooms across America, public, private, parochial, inner city, at-risk kids, rich suburban kids. So I've, I've done Socratic dialogue with thousands of kids in all kinds of conditions. And it turns out kids love talking. I mean, sometimes I'd say, have a teacher ask, is this appropriate for all children? I'd point at the cafeteria, kids love talking. And so it's a matter of creating a structure within which they can uh, redirect their craving to talk with each other in a productive direction. And I would say a lot of that is training them in certain habits and norms. The reason my book is called The Habit of Thought. Once kids have been in my schools, often they go off and do, as it were, Socratic meetups on their own. So I have had, I had a group of alumni who continued doing a weekend and summer Socratic after they left. I had a group of kids at one school who did a bonus Socratic once a week, completely student-led, student-driven with no adult environment involvement at all. So my belief is that once people are exposed to this and learn how to have a civil, respectful dialogue about ideas, at least a certain participant of the population of all you know, ages, demographics, socioeconomic levels, they love it and they're all in. And so for me, a lot of this is validating this as an important process and then creating um, the pathways so that different people in different groups can do it. 
But ultimately, my dream is student to student led Socratics that are in essence free. Um, you know, the great thing about for me is I, I can educate myself on anything for free. I think with if people know how to do this, um, they can educate themselves given online resources in anything for free. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, next up is Rupali uh, and Matthew. Rupali. Thank you, Michael. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, the example you gave in the beginning when you talked about yourself and you said you um, grew up on a farm. And part of education uh, for young adults is growing up on a farm or in my case, working with my father in his factory or my cousins working in the uh, cloth shop with their dad. The thing is that children were given responsibility at a very young age to handle money, to handle, to talk to customers, to run the business while the parent is somewhere around in the area. Well, how do you see that application in the current modern world where children are not given the responsibility, especially now that they're driven everywhere, they, they don't have the ability to take risk? So I, I don't have time to do a comprehensive answer. A short version is when we're in communities, we plug in people, whatever internships and so forth we can. But a, a big strand that is underdeveloped, I'm a big fan of the notion of new color jobs and new color jobs including include coding, SEO, um, digital marketing, video production and all of this. And it turns out that our high schools and colleges are terrible at new collar job preparation. And many teenagers are spectacular at new collar jobs. So one very concrete thing I tell my students is, look, every nonprofit, every small business needs a better website. They need better marketing videos. They need better digital marketing. So how, do, uh, how does a 13, 14 year old contribute? I get them out there working with clients. And it's pretty uh, consistent with genetic code. <laughs> So, but yeah, I think there are basically an unlimited number of jobs in kind of the, the new color digital workplace that teenagers can do better than many adults. So I get them up and, and they play a role and that real world responsibility is profoundly good for them. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, last question is from Matthew and then we're going to do breakout rooms. Matthew. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Strong. Thank you for this presentation. Unfortunately, I came in late, so I did miss a few things, but my friend Becky, who's on the line, explained a few pieces of your presentation to me. Um, I just had a question. So um, I'm a current high school teacher in, um, the, in New York City. I've been teaching for 10 years. I'm going into administration. And um, as a result, of course, I've seen and noticed a lot of the disparities um, within our children's curricula. A lot of them um, are entering the high school level with very limited skills um, for various reasons. I don't think there's a simple, it's this teacher's fault, that level's fault. Um, and so my question then is, what are some small steps that we can do at the public level so that we can start implementing or at least improving the current curricula to uh, you know, gauge critical thinking skills and some of the pieces that you're speaking about? So there are different levels at the public level. So first of all, I would say when I, I started doing public school Socratic in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, I would say one of the tragedies of public education is that the standards movement, which culminated in No Child Left Behind, um, dramatically reduced the um, autonomy of teachers. And so uh, frankly, the demand for my Socratic consulting peaked in the late 1990s. And then, you know, as we got all standards movement all the time, so there are still teachers, public school teachers doing Socratic seminars, but it takes, you know, a certain courage and confidence to do it. You know, um, my sense is that things are moving back to the other direction. There's more flexibility. Um, that said, my focus is on communicating to parents and educators, but especially parents, that reading and talking about ideas may in fact be more important than what your kid does in school. Um, you know, I, I'm very big on creating a culture of reading and a creating a culture of discussing ideas. One of the reasons I do my Alana videos is to model for parents how to do this with their kids. Because the magic of all this is that, um, you know, it really is free. You know, as long as you, have, you can read and you can have conversations with your kids, it's a fabulous, intellectually powerful thing you can do for free. Um, so can I fix public schools this year? Probably not, but um, if the big picture message is, look, reading and thinking about ideas is more important than the standard language arts uh, curriculum, uh, I'm pushing that wherever I can. 
Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. This was fantastic. And I look forward to having you back to continue this conversation because I think there is just so many things to explore. Uh, but what we're going to do now is we're going to do breakout rooms for 20 uh, minutes. Uh, this gives uh, Michael a break for lunch. And after 20 minutes, and during this 20 minutes, uh, we're going to discuss all the ideas that uh, Michael has presented. And then we're gonna come back into this room to talk about our takeaways where Michael will join us, okay? So I'm starting the breakout rooms now. All right, so folks, it's time for takeaways. Uh, this is the time you can talk about what did you get from this meetup? Also, if there is a big question that you're walking away with, uh, please put it on the table. Please uh, let us know. Uh, this is going to be voluntary. So anybody who wants to share their takeaways, what did you get from the meetup? Go ahead and put an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, I just want to tell you what is coming up. So at 2.30, we have a meetup. Uh, Angel, Dr. Angela Cortalasa is going to be here. And uh, she's going to be talking about the power of polymathy. And then at 4.30, I'll be talking about two great ideas from military that, are that I found extremely useful in daily life. Uh, this is going to be a preview of two presentations taking place next week uh, on OODA loop and uh, Dan Bolger's concept of earth pigs, uh, which transforms the US military. So that's coming up at 4.30. Angela will be here at 2.30. All right, so it's going to be um, Matthew, Dave, Jeff, and Kevin to start with. Matthew. Thank you. I wanted to go first because I'm going to have to leave soon. Um, I really love this talk. I really loved the conversation of breakout rooms and beforehand. One thing I definitely took away is um, more of a, a, a reminder and an, empower, and an empowerment to implement Socratic thinking, um, Socratic seminars, um, and other techniques that will really just foster critical thinking um, at all levels of schooling. Um, I'm really passionate about seeing um, our kids in public school, some of which who um, either don't have the resources or are unaware of the resources to go to, um, you know, uh, private or private schools, stronger schools, online schools that can foster this. So I really want to see it in the public dimension, and um, I really want to help train teachers um, and hopefully even administrators in the future in doing this because we really need to break away from the hard line focus. Um, I think you said it earlier, Michael, on standards. Um, and standardized tests, uh, they have their place. They, I don't think we should get rid of them. They have their place and they're useful, um, but they shouldn't be the central focus. The central focus should be critical thinking and pieces like that. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew. I've put email for uh, Michael uh, in the chat. You can email him and maybe we can, uh, you guys can, uh, you know, uh, help each other in whatever way. Uh, next up is Dave and, uh, uh, and uh, Matthew, really appreciate all, you know, your passion and uh, all the best to you. Um, and if there is anything we can do to help, we're always happy. Uh, next up is Dave, uh, Jeff, Kevin, and Laura. Dave. Thank you very much, Srikant. And uh, it was a wonderful discussion today. I think we all agree education needs major revisions. I think the big problem is all of our uh, administrators say, well, it was good enough for me and look, you know, I got a good education. So isn't what we do, it's just fine. But I, I rail on this time and time again, but 180 days, this is ridiculous to take the summer off so I can go back to the help with my dad in the fields. Well, we don't go back to help in the fields anymore. Uh, 200, 210, 220 days a year. I don't know what the magic number is. Um, I agree lecture is a disaster because we aren't cookie cutters. Um, it needs to be individualized. Uh, make sure every kid has a computer, a laptop, a, a tablet, whatever. And with software, it can be self-paced so easily and let the computer detect what the kid's learning style is and let the testing be built into the software and then the software tests when the, the kid is competent to move on to the next thing. And with comprehensivism, we tie everything together. Uh, I, I understand that there can be times during the day when the kids get together and talk, 
because I understand the, the value of that. But anyway, thanks very much for bringing the subject up, Shrikant, and, and hopefully many more times. Thanks again, Michael. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next up is Jeff, Kevin, and Laura. Folks, uh, if you want to share your takeaways, go ahead and type exclamation mark in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Jeff, you're next. Thank you so much for this, um, Michael. It was really uh, wonderful and uh, provocative. Um, I personally have, um, for the last several decades, been designing and conducting leadership programs uh, for about 20,000 uh, people around the, the world and uh, pretty intensive programs where we've sought to balance exactly the kinds of things that you're uh, talking about doing in educating uh, younger people. And I, I wanna give you an ex a quick example of something and get your comment on it because I think that the culture that's embedded in this method is, is really essential and I'm wondering how you do it. When we teach everybody from mayors to bankers, to emerging leaders in the South Bronx, how to deliver the most powerful speech they possibly could, could deliver. We teach them how to, how to tell a compelling story. And we ask them to start out by telling each other in groups of five, uh, in three minutes, what's something in your life that you really wanted? Because everybody has that experience. They come to that, they vote on which one of them has the most compelling story. And we take three or four of them at the top of the room and ask everybody to then notice what about that story was most compelling. We've sort of created a teachable moment. And at that moment, then we can go into the presentation regarding, all right, these are the things that create a compelling story. Everybody gets the assignment then to have to do that and to the next workshop, bring it back and, and tell it to each other. Um, so we're going there from their experience to uh, reflecting and, and asking questions about it, to learning and to the application, uh, you know, and then really the follow through and practice in doing it. I'm wondering how that compares with um, some of your methodology regarding some of the kinds of topics that you're addressing. Thank you. Sure. So uh, thank you, Michael. Let's do one thing. Let's uh, we'll we'll hold off responding to everything. Let everybody put their takeaways on the table, and then you can respond to Jeff and to anything else that anybody else says, because I want to get Sounds everybody's good. takeaways uh, first. Uh, next up is Kevin, followed by Laura. Kevin. Yes, thank you, uh, Miko. Uh, I, as a parent of a uh, public school, um, my big question is uh, how to fill up the gap from the standard curriculum from school and to the let's see let our kids centered learning style. I know it's not one day, maybe 20 years, we cannot change this system, this education system. It is so big, everyone do, do a single part from educator system south. Um, so that's my question, how to fill, fill up the gap. By the way, I'm so proud for yourself, your school. That's awesome, you from the young kids start to do this, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next up is Laura. If anybody else wants to share the takeaways, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Uh, next up is going to be Laura followed by Rupali. Laura. Hi, Michael, this is just wonderful. I mean, I feel like I'm walking in your footsteps though, because I'm not working now, but the years that I was working, it was in City College um, and, and my graduate work. And I worked with remedial students for many years and I, I worked on developing curricula that was suited toward developing them as learners. Um, one thing that was slightly different in my area was that I realized that we weren't teaching them how to learn. So um, I based what I did um, on developing metacognitive level. I used polia as my basis. Anyway, um, I, I agree with you on the need to remodel the schools. And I think about it all the time. And I, I agree with you on the design. I sort of kind of have the idea of like a Guggenheim Museum kind of thing for what the layout needs to look like in some sense so that you kind of spiral as you need and you can go up and down the spiral and you have these little interesting project kind of things going up and down. And I don't, I have to envision it. Anyway, if you want somebody to work with you on that, I'm ready. and. I think it's got to happen because, and we really have to have a, a real bomb on the educational system because it sucks. 
and I see it every day. My daughter's teaching elementary school and there's just so much nonsense in the system. And, you know, teaching to, to that test is ridiculous. I mean, they have to stop two weeks in advance of the test to get the kids ready so that they'll get a good score, you know, and that's just such a waste of time. Anyway, I'm fervent on that. And I will say that the, the mantra that I had in graduate school, instead of where there's a will, there's a way, you go, go with where there's a way, there's a will, so that when you, you give teachers, the kids the way, they'll develop the will. And I know they do, I, I did it. And I have this one little ditty, which I always tell. Um, I, when I put the kids in groups the first days in school, in class, they had no idea what to do. They constantly, oh, help, 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 help. I don't know what to do. How? And dead silence, you know, they're supposed to be talking. Anyway, at the end of the term, they didn't need me anymore. And there was the, my dedicated math class room was um, obviously uh, making a lot of noise. And this professor walked by thinking, what's going on in this class? It's a math class. What's all this noise about? Oh, is a history class there or something? So that was my math class, my kids working in their groups on their math problems, making a lot of noise. And the, the professor couldn't believe that it was a math class with noise coming out of it. So, so be it. That was my class. And those were those kids highly engaged in talking about the math problems. And I wrote a book, um, called quantitative literacy through algebra. And I also had the ability to work with an artificial tutoring system, um, developed at Carnegie, Learn, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and it became uh, ultimately a business called Carnegie Learning. If you want to look at that system, it's absolutely fantastic tutoring system. Um, thank, you. thank you, Laura. Laura, this is amazing. Thank you. I, I ran out of time. Anyway, I'll be in touch with you. Thank you. Great, great observations. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, next up is going to be Rupali and Frazier. Rupali. So uh, this was a fantastic conversation. The breakout room, uh, we had a very wonderful uh, discussion. Uh, during the break up, uh, breakout room, uh, one of the topics that came out was uh, Stand and Deliver. If people haven't watched that movie, uh, it's a fantastic movie of a, a teacher who encourages children to think and you know when they were not meeting benchmarks within a year they were transformed to be able to take ap classes and be successful so it just goes to say uh, to kind of uh, show what michael is saying that you know thinking is the first step in education and whether you take ap classes or not whether you go through a curriculum or not but if if children can think that really will help them learn and develop a love for learning. So um, my big question is, how do you train adults to impart the skill you know, to, to think? Because adults haven't gone through that system in their education. So how do you prepare the adult to teach how to think? Thank you. Excellent, excellent question, Rupali. Next up uh, is going to be Trevor, and then Michael will get to respond to uh, whatever uh, takeaways that people have. Uh, Trevor, go ahead. Oh, I didn't have a question. Oh, no, I, was actually just, I just posted sorry, a question my, for my, Laura. My, my mistake, my mistake, sorry. Uh, Frazier, Frazier, go ahead. Yeah, hey, Michael, thanks for the talk. It was really good. Um, so I think anybody, everybody kind of agreed in our breakout room. Um, yeah, the ed education system kind of needs an overhaul. And I was wondering, what do you think the major barrier, barriers are to kind of moving towards a mass implementation of like a more Socratic education system? All right, wonderful. Um, so Michael, um, we have several, several questions, several comments uh, on the table for you. You are free to respond to anything you got about, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes, so. Oh, well, I was, I thought maybe you'd have five minutes. So 15 and 20, yeah. 20 minutes leisurely. Yeah. Go ahead, yes. First, going back to Jeff's comment, student fundamental modalities. And so I would describe just as problem solving is a different modality from intellectuality, from Socratic intellectuality, rational, rational dialogue. I would say narrative and storytelling is a different modality. It's a super important modality for sure. And I didn't mention it much, much mostly because kids love storytelling. 
um, whether they make the stories or teachers give the stories. So storytelling, huge. I would say the element of what you do that's similar is then when you discuss which story is best. And we do something very similar. Um, you know, everything I do is as peer motivated as possible. So in addition to the Socratic discussions, I've had peer evaluations of writing and there's a whole world of peer editing out there where I get trained kids on how to discuss what counts as quality within their own and each other's writing in a civilized, respectful way. I mean, I would also say a different place where a similar uh, educational process exists is in the world of architecture and design where many people who are educated in architecture and design schools go through a process where there's a critique. And part of the education in these schools is to learn how to critique each other's work thoughtfully, respectfully, but seriously. So that, that's a huge world. And just as an aside, I'm also very aligned with a lot of decentralized management techniques. So I'm friends with Brian Robertson, the founder of uh, Holacracy. Um, and a number of people in my networks are very interested in that. So just like we don't want top-down learning, we don't want top-down management insofar as we can develop better alternatives. Um, why we can't do this, I, I think at scale, um, there's just way too much top-down control. I mean, frankly, I'm very much in favor of different approaches to school choice, including charters are most schools. So um, I did create one charter school where I, we had a little bit more freedom than regular public schools. But one of the reasons I'm actually doing low cost private is ultimately, I think, to have the freedom as an educator that I want. I, I want no strings attached. So um, I think that fear and anxiety and conflict around public education that, um, you know, when I was running a public school, I had to uh, <clears throat> please the school board. Of course, I had to please the parents, had to please the State Department of Education, and I had to comply with federal uh, regulations. And sometimes the State Board of Education was in contradiction to what the parents wanted and what the school board wanted. It's like having three bosses. So personally, I'm all in on low cost private, and I want to create um, systems where anybody can low cost. I'm very enthusiastic about tuition tax credits where in Florida they have fairly flexible tuition tax credits and I intend to offer expanse online to low income kids in Florida starting next year and I'm looking at various to do this. Um, so kudos to this within the public system or even the charter system. Um, I prefer the private and again it sounds radical but I even prefer private unaccredited because I'll give you one concrete example on accreditation. Um, we have an option to have our high school be accredited, it'll be important, but the accrediting system requires us to give grades. And if a student wants grades, again, I'm all about student aid to give you a grade, but I also like the option of not giving kids grades. Certainly, I don't like to grade Socratic because I want um, them by spontaneous interest and ideas and not I get more points for talking in front of the teacher. Um, but even projects, I would rather have a student be passionate about rather than, you know, you get see. So personally, I want a lot more choices, a lot more flexibility around choices. And again, um, making it. So I'm, I've been trying to kind of track all of the dialogue as well sure. in the uh, chat, but uh, no, happy no, to go in any in direction. Uh, uh, Michael, you can ignore the, uh, the, the chat. Anybody who wants to kind of raise the chat up to uh, discussion, they can just press uh, exclamation marks and folks will respond to it. That's, that's, the, that's the procedure. So that way we can keep on. I mean, one of the other interesting questions that was there was how do you train teachers? How do you train adults? Sure. Add and so yeah. first, one of the reasons I'm excited by students teaching students is I would say my best Socratic leaders are young people who've gone through my program. Personally, I prefer to hire people who've gone to St. John's or who have been to another great books program. I would say, Shrikant, I'd trust you as a teacher like that. Clearly, if you're part of the Morton Rattler tradition, you know, probably most of the people in your meetup. So a lot of this is experience and dialogue. You know, if you've got four years experience thinking, talking about ideas, if you know the range of ideas, you've explored, gone down lots of nooks and crannies in the world of thought, then you're pretty well prepared. Conversely, I once knew a man 
who in the 1990s had a $10 million grant for one particular high school, Timken High School in Ohio. At the time, it was the largest philanthropic grant to any public high school, and it was not allowed to be spent on, bri spent on bricks and mortars. But he decided, he gave up before he spent the money because he was a Socratic educator, and he realized all of the faculty had gone through Chicago public high schools, Chicago public universities, and at the age they can't teach somebody whose model of teaching is totally top down to engage in dialogue. So I would rather have a 19 year old graduate of my program train teacher. And in general, not trained teachers because the paradigm in teacher training is top down, it's content coverage. It's I'm judging you to see if you've gotten the right answer or not. Um, insofar as my goal is uh, to develop your intellectuality as a student. I want other people who are fascinated by your intellectuality as a student. My, um, my video series on YouTube, Discussions with Alana, is titled Loving Your Child's Mind. I don't want people who are teachers. I want people who are themselves curious, who themselves have the habit of thought, and who themselves love the minds of their children. And as far as I'm concerned, that has very little to do with traditional teaching. Wow, excellent, excellent. Uh, any other points you want to hit? So one thing I didn't get to is um, how Socratic, not only is big picture, but at a more granular level, is a powerful way to learn how to learn. So somebody mentioned metacognition. Metacognition is great, but fancy, you know, recent word from cognitive psychology, where you're aware of your own thinking processes. And it turns out there is a good research base on the more conscious and aware of your thinking processes, the better a learner you are. But look at Socrates. I know that I don't know. And the founder of St. John's, um, Scott Buchanan, said that if I know what I don't know, and then what I need to know, then I'll be my own best teacher and I'll be my own best guide to learning. And I think that's exactly right. And that's true whether or not I realize, oh, if I want to be a software developer, I need to code, or on a much more granular level. When we're going through difficult texts, paragraph by paragraphs, I ask students, um, what makes sense out of this paragraph? What do you understand? What don't you understand? What sentences? What phrases? What clauses? Um, do you know why there's a semicolon there rather than a colon? And so by means of training students when they read things to have a constant monitoring of, okay, how well, and knowing is not binary. It's not, I know it, I don't know. Typically for every moment by moment experience, we're between zero and 100% understanding. And so I want students to develop a habit of mind, habit of thought, where in real time, they're conscious of exactly how well they're understanding every element of what's involved. And then they can focus in on, okay, I don't get this, I need to go in and get that. And it turns out I've got a lot of experience doing this with students. Most students are not very good uh, at being aware of what they know and what they don't know. So high level Socratic goes into granular metacognition and how to learn how to learn. Wonderful. Um... I just I want to close in a few minutes, but what I want to do is I this has I think been extremely special uh, for me because I think we see eye to eye on pretty much everything here, um, and I think the common experience of saying that you have to take in the knowledge of the world, you know, through the great books program in whichever form uh, and combined. Now I, I think that this is a very powerful combination, taking in all of previous ideas and then actually talking to people, real life people. I mean, I'm fortunate I live in New York. So when I do meetups, I get people from all kinds of background with all kinds of experience, uh, just all kinds of ages, age groups. And what happens, this age group is also very interesting and diversity of experience is also very interesting. When you are having a conversation, if you are the more diverse the group of people that you're having this conversation with, the more you're likely to learn because people are going to come at it from, from multiple angles. So I look forward to seeing what we can do on that, you know, of saying what, you know, this, uh, you know, I, I think the great books program can be revived. Uh, there used to be a time where there used to be great books clubs everywhere, you know. Um, so so I'm, I'm very excited about that. And I really want to explore more things that we can do together. So I'm very, very, um, I, this was just a fantastic experience. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And again, I'm passionate about this. Feel free to get in touch. And I hope to have more conversations with many of you. 
uh, Dialogue is Life. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, Michael.